want to know what I'm doing up here, so I'll explain to you. Uh, a few years ago, can you still see me here? Because I, I want to be close. <laughs> By the way, I, was, I did the same thing Dave did, you know, the first guy. I got a runner-up at the Cab Bagua canoeing uh, fair, so <laughs> I feel we're, we're bonded there. But um, a few years ago, I was named uh, Poster Girl for Mental Illness. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> some of you may recognize me. And um, the way that came, I mean, I didn't want that role, but it was hoisted upon me. And the way that, <laughs> the way that happened is, uh, you know, Comic Relief gives some money that year to mental health charities, and they said, could they take a picture of me, because they knew I wasn't right. So, um, so I thought it was going to be like a little postage size stamp picture, you know, because I wasn't that famous then. Well, I dipped, you know, and, and your picture is up the size of how many viewers you get. So instead, they surprised me. They put a huge, huge poster of me in every tube station that said, this woman has mental illness, please help her. <laughs> So I was mortified, and uh, I hurled myself in front of the first one. But then they were just, I just hurled all, they were everywhere, right? So, um, so I thought, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna write a show and make that look like it's my publicity poster. <laughs> Savvy? So I wrote a show, and then for two years I toured, I toured it in mental institutions, and um, I think they liked it. I couldn't tell they weren't always facing me. <laughs> And, and the bipolars used to say, I laughed, I cried. <laughs> and if you can make a schizophrenic laugh, you're halfway to Broadway. <laughs> so uh, anyway, then I took it to real theaters <laughs> with normal people. And uh, it went all over the, you know, I took it to different continents. And, um, and what was incredible is everywhere and even beyond where I am, it is one in four people who have something wrong in the upstairs department. So if it was like, one, two, three, four, it's you with the mustache. <laughs> yeah, you're not right. I can see that. And she's not right either. Is that your wife? <laughs> she has a mustache too. That's not right. Actually, that whole row is a write off. That's not right. You know, it's, um, it's amazing to me that even when I came to the UK, it was one in four. Because, you know, it's ironic because I left America to get away from crazy people. I came here because I thought people were charming and delightful, lovely people, people like Mary Poppins. Whole country having a cup of tea going, would you like a cup of tea? Oh, I don't know, would you like a cup of tea? Oh, that might be lovely. Would you like it with a lump or two lumps? A lump, I don't know, should I have a Otherwise they were talking about the weather, going, do you think it's cold? No, I think it's breezy. Do you think breezy? I thought it would be blowing. Do you think blowing? I thought nippy. Now one in four, kaput, gone. But you know, I didn't, when I was a kid, nobody knew about mental illness. Nobody ever discussed it. Or they didn't even have a, a diagnosis for it. My mother, right, who used to um, move around like a pool cleaner in the house on all fours, with the sponge connected to her hands and one tied onto her knees, uh, used to go, who brings filth into a building? They didn't think anything was wrong with her. No. The doctor said she was having a turn. Yeah, or no, they were saying she's having a change of life. <laughs> yeah, for the last 87 years. So anyway, I thought, uh-oh, something's gonna go wrong with me too, because uh, stuff was already weird. You know, I used to take to my bed for a few days at a time, but it didn't feel like I was tired. It just felt like I was hibernating, but I couldn't wake up. So I thought, I didn't tell anybody, right? Because I don't want anybody to think I was nuts. So uh, I always saw when I grew up, when I finally had a breakdown, it would be because I had a deep Kafkaesque existentialist revelation. <laughs> or that maybe Kate Blanchett would play me. <laughs> and she'd win an Oscar for it. And then at the award ceremony, the whole auditorium would stand up and give me a standing ovation for all my pain. <laughs> but that's not what happened. No, I had my final implosion during my daughter's sports day. Yep. During the sports day, there were all the parents eating food out of the back of their car in a parking lot, only the English. Lord and Lady Rigamortis were nibbling on the tarmac. And there were all the mummies speaking in their secret code, going, oh, do you know, it's just awful. Do you know, Sophie Ch Ch 
sister was doing her postnatal yoga class and she threw up on her mat and she was wearing a lovely frock. Oh, where was the frock from? I think the frock's from Marnie's. Oh, I love Marnie frocks. Where's your frock from? My frock's from Mew Mew. Oh, I love Mew Mew frocks. <laughs> They're so floaty and breezy and floaty, 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 floaty. Some of the frocks have straps that go down and some of the frock straps come up. I didn't feel like I belonged there. <laughs> you know those nature films where an ostrich is being raised by polar bears? <laughs> anyway, the gun went off and all the girlies started running, 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 running. All the Clytemnestras and the begonias and all the mummies were going, run, run, chlamydia, run. <laughs> were running, 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 except for my daughter. She was just standing at the starting line, just waving. Because <laughs> she didn't know she was supposed to run. So she's just waving. So suddenly I had a flashback. You know, I remembered when I was eight years old and I was in a race, you know, and I was huge teeth in another time zone going, come on, you guys, come on, I don't want to be left behind. And my parents were going, hun, will be hun. And I went, shut the fuck up. So then <laughs> I started to go down, you know, I didn't feel that, I started to go down and uh, people were going, are you all right? And I went, yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna smell the grass. Okay, I'm gonna, are you sure you're all right? Yeah, I'm fine, really, I'm just gonna put my head in the parking lot. <laughs> and then my husband found me and he put me in an institution. <laughs> we had some insurance money so I could stay for one hour. Because they don't like when people don't run out of money. We saw some women when we got there. They just had electroshock therapy. They made them leave the building. Their heads were still smoking. <laughs> anyway, I, turns out they let me stay. I got to kind of pay and then you pay later. Pay as you go, I think. Anyway, we have to pay them back later. So, uh, I, you know, when I got there, I loved these people. I really loved them, especially the more chronic inmates. You know those ones that shuffle around in their 2,000-year-old house slippers? Their hair's on fire. And there was one woman I really loved her. Every day I'd go, hey, Ida. Ida, what's happening with you today? Ida, come on. She'd go, there's a communist living in my back molar. <laughs> now that's a conversation opener. <laughs> we used to steal food from the anorexics. They didn't mind. <laughs> But you know, I love these people. I loved them because they became my only friends. Because I didn't tell any of my other friends. So I wasn't, I didn't get any cards or um, flowers. I mean, if I had been with a child or I had a broken leg, I would have been inundated. But all I got was a couple phone calls telling me to perk up. Yeah, perk up. Because I didn't think of that. <laughs> I mean, when you have a mental thing, you get a double whammy because your brain has gone down and there's no other brain left to make an assessment that something's wrong. I mean, if you had a spare brain, I could tell you, but you don't. So I had to finally go up to a friend of mine and I had to say, do I look crazy to you? And she went, yes. <laughs> so um, so I, uh, I didn't tell anybody because, uh, and I checked out right away because it was too embarrassing. So I came out and I said, uh, I'm fine, I'm perfectly fine, because here's something you get with this disease, this comes with the package, you get a real sense of shame, because your friends go, oh, come on, I know people with real diseases, so show me a lung, come on, show me an x-ray. So of course you can, so you're so disgusted at yourself. You're just disgusted because you think, wait a minute, I'm not being carpet bombed. I don't live in a township. You know, look, at, I got shoes I'm eating, you're just disgusted. So you start to get these abusive voices, but you don't get one abusive voice, you get about 100,000 abusive voices, like if the devil had Tourette's, that's what it would sound like. But actually, you know, there's no devil, you know that. There's no voices in your head. What you really have in your head is if you cracked your skull open, don't try that at home, you would find about three pounds of the most sophisticated piece of meat on this planet, and that piece of meat is you, that's it. That's why you laugh and cry and fall in and out of love and dream of doing Zumba. That's it. <laughs> Throw the rest away, gone. And when you have a thought, something physical happens in your brain. There is no imagination. Something does happen with those hundred billion neurons. 
So I'm going to make it simple. If you get a good thought or a good uh, experience, all those nerves, nerve cells, try, try to get together, right? But they have a little gap, and in that gap, you get a real feel-good chemical. I'm making this simple. Now, if you have a, a bad thought or bad, a negative thing happens, all those little neurons get together, and in the gap, you get a real toxic, I want to kill myself kind of chemical. And some people can't get off that loop, and they just feel that negative thing over. It doesn't matter if it's sunny out or they have beautiful children. They can't get off that loop. And, and by the way, it doesn't matter if you're famous or you live in a mud hut or what culture you come from, depression just loves everybody. <laughs> and that's not even the tip of the iceberg. If you get a little baby and you abuse it verbally, its little brain sends out chemicals that are so destructive that the part of his brain that can tell right from wrong just doesn't grow. So you might have yourself a homegrown psychotic. If a soldier sees his friend blown up, his brain goes into such high alarm that he can't actually put the experience into words. So he just feels the horror over and over and over again. So that's my question. That's my question. How come people with mental damage, it's always down to an act of imagination? How come every other organ in your body can get sick and you get sympathy except the brain? Well, anyway, <clears throat> I decided I need to know, know this, you know, as to why this was happening. Because I, um, I've been sick for about, um, I haven't been sick for about seven years, and then suddenly, um, well, I, nothing dramatic happened. This is about seven years ago, and I haven't had it for seven years. It wasn't like, uh, you know, I had that bipolar thing where you want to snowboard down the uh, Sydney Opera House. <laughs> I never had anything dramatic, uh, but I, it turns out I, I had depression, so nothing, it was not, no drama. I mean, I didn't suddenly set my hair on fire like Ida. I just sat on a chair for three months. That's it, I couldn't leave the chair. I mean, it's unbelievable that I'm standing here, but the nurse would have to come in, and she'd hold my hand for 10 minutes, and then she'd have to go, and I just sat in a white sweat on the chair. And then weeks went by, and then she took me to the front door, and then I had to come back to the chair, because everything in that room was dangerous, especially the shower. So then finally one day, she took my hand, she took me to the door, she took me out of the door, and then I was okay. And I cannot believe I felt that terror, and now I'm standing here. But anyway, I thought, I really want to know why this stuff is going on. I really want to know. So what I did, because I know everything happens in the mothership, I thought, okay, I'm going to enroll a class. I'm not going to enroll. I'm going to crash a course at UCL on neuroscience. <laughs> yeah, I thought, I'm 87 and a half. It's time. <laughs> so I, I crashed the course, and everybody in the class was 21. You know, So I told them I had a disease that, make, that makes me look really old. <laughs> And then they found out I really was old. <laughs> but anyway, in the end, they liked me because I had the car. <laughs> so I did learn a lot of stuff. But OK, I'd just like to give you some of my conclusions. Would you mind that? OK, some of them are right, and some of them I made up. <laughs> but what's the difference? OK. <laughs> uh, see, now, am I? My uh, theory is that no, none of this is our fault, right? Evolution didn't prepare us for all this. I mean, uh, 21st century, we're not prepared. It's just too hard, it's too pressurized, too full of fear. We don't have the bandwidth, okay? So my theory is that we were fine 100,000 years, hundreds of thousands of years ago, fine, you know, when we were on the open plain, savanna, with our knuckles dragging on the floor and our big one eyebrow. We were fine, no OCD, no panic attacks. But then when we'd feel danger, right, when we feel danger, the amygdala that he was talking about, it also, it's a part of the brain where you, um, where you register fear or high emotions. As soon as that goes, it's like a car alarm. It sends information to the body and cortisol and adrenaline fill your system to get you ready to rumble. You know, so it'll turn you from nice guy to killer maniac in a few seconds. You, you know the Hulk when he gets really angry? That's what we do. So then after the squabble with this predator, if you're still left standing, all the, all the cortisol adrenaline goes back down, and we go back to doing what we love best, which was picking bugs off each other. I miss those days. <laughs> but now the problem is the amygdala and the cortisol, they never come down because everything now is a state of emergency. 
everything. And that stuff just sits in your body and burns you out. And, and the point is that we know everything that's going on in the world just by a click of the button and our brain can't tell if there's a predator behind us or the danger is 20,000 miles away. I mean, why do I need to know? Because I'm in alarm all the time by the news incoming. You open a newspaper and everybody's dead. I mean, why do I need to know if there's a 3.6 earthquake in Fondoko? Why do I need to know that? It'll upset me. Or there's a shark attack in Malawi. Do I need to know this? We're only supposed to know what our neighbors are up to. That's how we were made. Like if the woman next door to me is having the sex with the man next door to her, I should know that. <laughs> I should know that. But four doors down, I don't need to know. <laughs> so the other thing I learned at the school, and this is amazing, I, do, I cannot understand why it's not on every headline of every newspaper. It's not on TV 24 hours a day. You learn there, I don't know. It's, why it's not written in books, beside mine, uh, but it's not written in books, <laughs> even 27 Shades of Grey doesn't mention it, is that everybody, it, your brain, right, the structure of your brain, the neural connections can change depending on if you change your thoughts. We aren't at the mercy of our genes. They used to think, you know, how you came into the world is how you're going out. Mm -mm. The genes just give you the blueprint. It's like a deck of cards, but how you play it is up to you. I mean, this is incredible to me. So, oh, I've lost my sound. Can you hear me? Yeah. Because, you know, we really, our world gets, if we don't kind of realize that we've got habits, what they, what they can see, let me just try and explain, in, in, a, in a piece of, you know, when they do brain research, they can actually see into the brain. I mean, that's science. They can see it. I, I never understand why friends of mine come up to me and they ask me my star sign. It's 2013. Or they give me an angel card. You know, I usually say thank you, but inside my brain, I'm already deleting them from my contact list. <laughs> so I was thinking angel card or science, eeny meeny, so I picked science, call me crazy. So anyway, when you're studying science, you can see in a brain scanner, you, like let's say when you're, you can see how you think. And if you think a certain thing over and over and over again, some of those neurons start to connect. And if you get in that habit and just stay the same way every day, they get really solid. And that's why you have habits, which begs the question, do you have a personality or just your set of, set of habits? And when you get locked into that, which we all do, your, the, your view of the world gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you think your reality is the only one. I mean, actually, when we see somebody, it's only we're not seeing them. We're seeing them through a filter of our memory. We actually hold people hostage to who they remind us of. And then there's people, you know, who actually create situations to make them seem like their reality is the only one. Like, you know, I have friends, women who say that they're victims or, you know, men are all bastards. And so they create situations to prove that's true. They say things like, I went on the serial killer website and he never called me again. But this thing, this, this neuroplasticity is remarkable. I mean, you can actually unwire, unwire what's not helpful and then rewire what would probably give you a more flexible life or dare I say it, make you happier. So I thought, well, wait a minute. I gotta try this because actually evolution doesn't care about your happiness, it cares about your survival. So I thought, I gotta try this. There is a way to self-regulate. So I thought, how am I gonna do that? So I did research, you know, I looked it up. I didn't go on a weekend for hugging your elf. Uh, I looked it up and I found out that it's mindfulness and cognitive-based therapy that have the best results for self-regulating, bringing my own chemicals down. Because I didn't want to have any more depressions. So, um, so I thought, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not gonna take a risk here. So I, I decided to do both. And what I did was I hunted down the founder of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and he was in Oxford. So I got to him, and he's, I said, wait a minute, I want to really um, know how this affects the brain. I don't want anything fluffy. I want to know what goes on. And he said, unfortunately, you'd have to get into Oxford. <laughs> so um, I crossed out some of my old SAT scores. You know what those SATs are? Well, if you do, I got 475, which is lower than a houseplant. <laughs> So I crossed it out, but I give really good interview. So I got in. <laughs> and I graduated six weeks ago. Thank you. So, I, you know, you do learn about the brain, but you also have to practice mindfulness.
mindfulness because otherwise you won't be able to control those uh, the wiring and unwiring. And uh, it doesn't if it's not for you, forget about it. But what is remarkable is it. First of all, the myth that anybody's mind goes empty. If somebody tells you that, it means they're dead. <laughs> it won't go empty. But what it does is it changes your relationship to those thoughts. You know, those thoughts, I gotta, I do, you know, you, do, you aren't those thoughts. So you become the observer. And once you kind of stand back and watch them, you're already, you're already unwiring the neurons. And the habit starts breaking just by, in that gap, you don't have to react like you always do, like I always pounce on people, especially if they attack me first. I become like a kind of animal, and everybody else is roadkill. Other people become victims. But if you hold back your regular reaction, in that gap, you have a chance to create a new habit. I mean, what it's basically, and then you do notice that the thoughts aren't solid, that they come and they're like the weather. If you hold on long enough, you see them coming and going. I mean, what it's basically doing is it's teaching you to pay attention, or it's teaching you to exercise your attention. I mean, everybody says, what are you talking about? I pay attention. I go, oh yeah, eat a piece of chocolate. By the third bite, your brain is somewhere in Bulgaria. <laughs> so what it does is it teaches you how to focus on what you want to focus and focus away from it if you don't want to focus. So you learn to pay attention on where your brain is. Okay, it could be ruminating, waste of time. You know, when you're churning, going, why did he leave me? Why am I not hot? Why can't I twerk as well as Miley Cyrus? Okay, that's <laughs> rumination. <laughs> goes on, you'll never, come, you'll never come to any conclusion, or you can mind wander. People spend 50% of their life mind wandering, and nobody's happy about it, it makes you miserable. So when you notice that you don't particularly want to be in that zone, I know this, please go with me on this one. If you send your attention away from the, you know, constantly criticizing voices, if you send it to any one of your senses, like uh, the feeling your feet on the ground, or listening, or tasting, or seeing, or hearing, it uses another part of the brain. It's the insula, and that's the part you actually activate when you feel something like a stomach ache or you trip on your toe. This isn't fairy dust, it's actually another part of the brain. The minute you start to feel the floor or you feel yourself breathing, the amygdala automatically comes down because you can't be in thinking mode and sensing mode at the same time. It's like you can't drive a sports car in two gears at once, it just won't drive. So you're actually tricking the mind. I mean, basically, that's all mindfulness is. It's not a, you know, eternal bliss or a white light or a phone call from Oprah, <laughs> really. That's it. And, and what was um, kind of great about it, it's not gonna make my depression go away. That's not gonna happen. But when it did start bubbling up, because you're so, you're not paying attention, I can hear the early warnings, so I can hear the pitter-patter sort of like an animal does before a tsunami. And this time, instead of having 10,000 dinner parties and, or doing work all night or starting to drink, which is my habit, because you don't want to really face what's coming, I start to cancel everything. I checked in somewhere, no television, no nothing. And you can actually feel, if you wait and don't get busy, you can feel the cortisol come down. Because, um, and it's not just for depression. Um, they say by 2020, it's going to be stress that kills all of us. And that's simply by the way we think. I mean, can you believe this? There's countries in the world where people are like being bombarded by war or they're starving to death. And here in the West, where we have everything, we're killing ourselves with our own thinking. Isn't that unbelievable? So, you know, my point is here. We blame everything on the world. You know, we say, the reason I'm miserable is because of climate change or, um, recession or who's the prime minister or the president. You know, that's the reason the world's in a mess. I mean, somebody voted for them. They didn't drop from heaven. The real thing is that the conflict is in here and then we project it onto the world. The bully is now there, it's in here. Inside our brains, there's always war and things will never change until we declare a truce in our own minds. That is my speech on world peace over now. Thank you very much.